Christchurch Airport, the 27th of September 1990. The 9am boarding call has been made and 30 passengers head for the aircraft waiting at gate 11. The aircraft we're boarding is not your usual sleek passenger jet. It's a rather ungainly looking craft with a chubby fuselage and curious twin booms jutting from the rear. But that's not what makes this flight special. This is Safe Air Flight 331 bound for the Chatham Islands. With Captains Mike Tavener and Ian Perry on the flight deck, we climb out of Christchurch and set course for the Chathams, nearly 800 kilometres to the east. It's a perfect spring morning as Safe Air 331 crosses the coast and heads out over the Pacific. A 22-year-old link with New Zealand's most isolated community is about to be broken, and 40 years of flying will come to an end. Down here by the sea may seem a strange place to start a story about an airline, but this is Cook Strait, the often turbulent stretch of water separating New Zealand's North and South Islands. And getting from here in the North Island to there in the South Island has never been easy, as many shipwrecked or stranded travellers have discovered. And in the boom years of rapid development following World War II, this physical barrier became an economic barrier. There just had to be an easier way to cross it. Aeroplanes seemed an obvious solution, and the first regular Cook Strait service began in 1935. After the war, there were plenty of DC-3s available, and on the 10th of February 1947, they flew the inaugural rail air service between Woodburn and Paraparaumu. NAC later took over the service, but the DC-3s, which had to be hand-loaded, were soon unable to cope with the rapidly increasing demand. What was needed was a specialist freight airline, using purpose-built planes. In 1950, a group, including former RNZAF men Tom O'Connell and Rob Hamilton, formed a company especially to do the job. They called it Straits Air Freight Express. SAFE for short. SAFE was a very good name for any airline to have. Back in 1930, one American company had also thought of it. Safe Air do have a company logo, but for many years their real symbol was this, the Bristol Freighter. Its improbable shape, bull nose and fixed undercarriage once inspired an American traffic controller to ask the pilot if it was homemade. It wasn't, of course, though they do have a homely look about them. And Safe Air had 11 Bristol Freighters, the largest commercially owned fleet in the world. Craft that those who flew and serviced them built up a tremendous amount of respect and affection for. The 19th of May 1951 was a great day at Woodburn Airfield. Most of Blenheim had turned out to celebrate the arrival of SAFE's first Bristol freighters. The company had chartered Curtis Commandos for the first few months, but the new Bristols were the pride of Marlborough. Captains Hamilton and Boys had flown them out from England, and Ham Hamilton also commanded the first commercial flight on the 31st of May 1951. On their first working day, Safe's Bristols carried 20 tonnes of salt to the North Island and brought five cars and two tractors back. For the first few months, the Bristols still had to be loaded by hand. Although this was much easier than on the DC-3s, it wasn't until 1952 that a unique new system really speeded things up. It's a piece of equipment which has helped build the biggest regular freight airlift in the world, the railway air link between the North and South Islands of New Zealand. Stacked with six tonnes of freight, 
the cargo tray takes the place of the normal aircraft floor. Known as a cargon, it can be unloaded eight times faster than by hand. One man now handles what previously needed six men to shift, and not only faster, but more safely. Designed by Thomas O'Connell of Timaru, the Cargon enables air freighters to be unloaded and reloaded in 12 minutes from landing to takeoff. Interest in the method has been shown by many overseas countries. Tom O'Connell's Cargon was a freight handling miracle. Six tons out, six tons in, six minutes on the chocks. There was barely time for the pilot's cup of tea. From Wellington Airport at Paraparam, Straits Air Freight's express planes take off soon after two o'clock every day. Within 30 minutes, the cargoes they carry reach the railways of South Island. The course bears southwest across Cook Strait, a beautiful stretch of water, but a gap between two railway systems which must be bridged. Ahead lies Tory Channel, named after the 400-ton ship which pioneered settlement in New Zealand. The Bristols were in business, and the roar of their Hercules engines became a familiar sound over Blenheim and the Kapiti coast. Though ponderous and noisy, they proved to be excellent for the job, a real pilot's aircraft, well liked by all who flew them. Not too different uh, from the Piper Cubs and the Tiger Moths, or just the, the size really, commonly called an old tail dragger, lovely old airplane to fly, a real old lady, very stable. Plenty of time to uh, glance at the paper or, or perhaps the nav log and drink coffee. Yes, they were a pleasant airplane to fly. The Bristol Freighter, you actually uh, never stop flying until you're upstairs having a cup of tea. <laughs> like, uh, for instance, if you landed it, uh, half the fun was actually taxiing it in, particularly at Wellington, where the, the winds were ferocious sometimes, and uh, ta taxiing crosswind was always a little bit difficult, and the, the brakes weren't really terrific, so uh, sometimes you were really having a bit of a struggle. But it was a great machine to fly. Um, essentially it was a 40s aircraft um, and from a person of my age to, to spend several years flying a, a World War II type aircraft was a great experience. So it taught me an awful lot. It had no de-icing equipment to speak of really so you really had to plan your whole trip and uh, it was probably the fact we had so many experienced captains with us, highly experienced guys that uh, really and truly they, they gave us that rubbed off on us. Over the next 35 years, the Bristols carried an incredible range of goods across the strait and to other parts of the country. If it could fit on a railway wagon, it would fit in a Bristol, and sooner or later, it did. It was a boom time for the country's farmers, and the Bristols often looked like, and smelt like, an aerial Noah's Ark. Thousands of sheep, pigs, cattle and deer enjoyed safe's in-flight service, though the deer seemed happy at not watching the scenery. Horses too were frequent passengers, though some of them seemed less than enthusiastic when the final boarding call was made. You could just about name it and we carried it. We carried it everything from a small parcel up to a, a railway wagon. We carried cars, we carried stock, we carried out quite an incredible range of goods and, and uh, equipment. Including horses? Including horses, yes. What was it like flying horses around uh, the skies? Well, uh, pers day. personally I was never very keen <laughs> of uh, flying horses, partly because very early in my career we had a uh, rather a nasty incident with one. A horse, as you know, is uh, a fairly heavy beast, they weigh about half a ton, and of course if they really start moving around you can really feel it in the aeroplane. Anyway, we got about halfway across and there was all this, suddenly the aircraft started moving around and we knew that one was really playing up. Next thing, the hatch, uh, on the Bristol Fay they've got a hatch on the uh, come up from the hold up into the cockpit and the hatch flew open and here was a very white-faced young man and he said the horse is getting out of the box so uh, the captain looked at me and he said well hand him the crash axe and he said if he because if he got out of the box he could have done us a lot of damage he could have actually punched himself right through the side so all we could do was just give the aircraft full power and go like hell to get the power frame before he really uh, you know, causes any damage Other things didn't always go exactly as planned either. Bristol ZK AYG in particular made a few unscheduled stops. In 1951, the brakes failed and it ran out of runway at Paraparaumu. Three years later, it did the same thing at Woodburn. 
The air accidents inspector was quickly on the scene on his departmental bicycle. And in 1955, AYG ended up in the Omaka riverbed after engine problems. She wasn't an unlucky plane, she just kept being in the wrong place at the wrong time. When a storm blew in the hangar doors at Parapara Umu, it was almost inevitable that they would fall on E. But real disaster was to strike on the 21st of November 1957. Flying over Christchurch, the starboard wing broke off Bristol ZK AYH and the aircraft plunged into Rusley Golf Course. The four on board, including company founders Tom O'Connell and Captain Hamilton, were killed instantly. All the other Bristols were grounded and inspected before continuing operations a few days later. The aircraft was soon replaced. The lives on board and the expertise of the company's two top men were gone. Business continued to grow through the late 50s and early 60s. The Cook Strait service was now running very smoothly, but the arrival of the first inter-island ferry in 1962 caused rail air freight to drop off dramatically. New general manager Des Linsky vigorously pursued new routes and services, securing contracts to carry mail for the post office and freight for NAC. The pilot's increasing experience in flying Bristols was matched by the engineer's skills keeping them flying. The hangar was always busy, adjusting, repairing, modifying or rebuilding Bristols, and the skills gained were readily applied to all sorts of other projects. The Wellington windbreak was one such design, intended to shelter the open cargo doors from the worst of the capital's gales. Deslinski's drive to diversify brought ongoing maintenance contracts for the Air Force, NAC and various smaller airlines. The later merger with Air New Zealand saw engineering work increase dramatically, a separate prop shop being built in 1979. One of the more unusual safe jobs was the total rebuild of a classic Bristol automobile. It took 15 months, but when driven to the freighter for delivery, the Marlborough Express said it all. A lovely pair of Bristols. The Bristol fleet expanded through the 60s to a peak of 11 aircraft, and so of course did the staff. SAFE's pilots often came from the nearby Marlborough Aero Club, Captain Hamilton being the first of many chief flying instructors to join the company. By now, SAFE senior captains like Jim Howard, Keith Beatty and Cliff Fantham were among the world's most experienced Bristol pilots. It wasn't just magnificent men in the Bristols either. Sue Truman and later Lou Gollop were also aerial truckies. Lou later flew in the last great Bristol formation when Captain Alan Graham led a noisy farewell foursome over Blenheim. On well, the very first day I set foot in a Bristol aeroplane, uh, I was in, as an observer, so 
someone else was doing their training and we took off and had a genuine engine failure so that was fairly exciting from the start. I think the thing about wanting to go to SAFE was because the aeroplane was old, the technology was old. Uh, it was a big aeroplane to me, it was a tail dragger which was a little bit different from most modern airliners and uh, oh, it was all just different, exciting, anyone who likes aviation always likes a new aeroplane. New aeroplanes, however, inevitably become old aeroplanes. By 1986, the Bristols had worked for SAFE for 35 years, longer than any of their pilots. Steve Peterson and Lou Gollop made the final Bristol crossing of Cook Strait on the 26th of September. And four days later, Bob Gard and Tim Allen flew the last scheduled service. All that remained was to fly them off to retirement. The flight took about 45 minutes all told, but most of that was just when we got there, we had a look at the airstrip and then we went off to have one last look at Nelson, you know, let the Bristol say goodbye to Nelson, and then finally came in, had a, another approach and overshoot at the airfield and finally landed. And uh, it was all pretty exciting. And, but then when we actually came shutting down the engines, it was quite a sad moment. And uh, having got out, we then had the manager of Safe Air there to hand over the aeroplane officially and had the official signing in on the last log entry. And uh, again, it got very sad because the engineers jumped in and they taxied the aeroplane off across the paddocks and unfortunately they got it stuck. So when I went, the engineers were leaving the aeroplane and there was something like eight or ten cattle rushing over to investigate it. And uh, when I last saw it, it was surrounded by cattle sitting amongst the long grass. Two and a bit hours after leaving Christchurch, we're approaching the Chathams. The coast is nearly always shrouded in mist, the result of warm westerlies meeting cold Antarctic currents. The original Moriori settlers called the islands Rekaho, misty skies. From the air, the landscape looks as it is, sparsely populated and rugged. There's no easy living to be made here. It's never been an easy place to fly to either. For one thing, if you miss the island, it's 10,000 kilometres to the next airstrip in Chile. As there's nearly always a good crosswind at the Karewa Point airstrip, even an aircraft as big as the Argosy really has to be flown all the way down to the runway. The local school has closed early for the last flight, so there's a big crowd waiting at the airport. Plane day has always been an important day for this isolated community, though it wasn't till the Second World War that an aeroplane was first seen over the Chathams. <laughs> Long-time resident David Holmes remembers. 1940. It was the Aotearoa that used to fly to Sydney from Auckland, flew over here searching for the raiders that sunk the Homewood the day after, before it sank the Rangatani. So they didn't find it? No, they didn't see any raiders, but after the war it was reported the raiders seen the plane but the plane didn't see the raiders. After the war, flying boats started to come more regularly. An RNZAF Sunderland made the first passenger flight in May 1946, bringing the islanders their first airmail, 56 pounds of it. More Air Force Catalina and Sunderland flights followed, making the round trip from Wellington's Evans Bay. Then came Teal's Big Solence, and a little later, the Sandringham's of Ansett, Australia. The flying boats were all chartered by the Department of Island Territories and flew five or six return trips each year. Well, most of them were return trips. A mute memorial to the difficulties there have been in servicing the Chathams by air. This propeller came off a of Sunderland, which in 1959 had a reef in the lagoon and stayed. 
Other parts of it became the framework of a school bus sitting on a tractor, storage sheds and even a foul house. It's not often that building materials fall out of the air, even on the Chathams. Air Force flying boats continued to fly to the Chathams, but their days were numbered, and it was obvious a land-based service had to be found somehow. Up at Te Haupupu, the Barker brothers had an airstrip of sorts, but it needed considerable upgrading for a regular service. And then, who could fly there? In 1967, the government called tenders and SAFE got the job. Des was delighted and the engineers swung into action designing and building a lightweight passenger capsule to fit inside the Bristol. This special capsule was a minor engineering miracle, turning a slow, noisy freight plane into a slow, noisy passenger plane. Three hours to the Chathams, up to four hours back and earplugs for all the passengers. Captains Cliff Fantham and Keith Beatty flew the first safe flight on the 23rd of January 1968, and regular service started a week later. David Holmes was there. That was at Harpoopoo. Mark had built the Harpoopoo airport of some 25 or odd years ago, and then they, they flew in Bristol freighters belonging to the Air Force for a while, and then SAFE took over with their Bristol centers for regular service. How important to the growth of the island was the regular service that uh, Safe Air established? Oh, it made a big ago. difference. You could go up for a week or two and do what business you had to do and come back. But they were limited to their, uh, what they could carry compared to the uh, Argosy. Often you, you, you had to leave a suitcase behind if you were overweight with them and uh, it had come sometime later. Because there was a, a problem on the airstrip itself, because if there was too much weight apart from anything else, the Bristol was inclined to get stuck. And yeah, well, they were the only aircraft in New Zealand that carried shovels. <laughs> well, the Harpipu airfield is made of um, it's grass and um, shingle was very, very ground up uh, shell, which made it very, very slippery. And when you went through the crust on the top, the aircraft went down, and I mean down. And what we used to have down there was two pieces of steel cable and uh, blocks of wood into disperse, and we used to roll that mat out, dig, dig the trench out, put that in, and then get in and give it uh, full power, and out we come, and then uh, leave the local people the task of filling in the hole for the next time. Well, the only contact to the mainland is uh, the passengers by air. So uh, we're, we're depending on it completely entirely. Without that, that's the only contact with mainland mail and passengers we buy air. Without that, we'd be cut off completely. You know, one of the pilots in the, in the very early days on the uh, grass trip at Harpoopu, he'd find his way in on a foggy day. There's no means of by following the lake round that was just off the end of the airport. And after he'd come to the first bend, he said, well, I'll straighten up then, and in front of me would be the airport. That was a type of Knowledge, local knowledge they had of the place, and that was the type of pilot we had. Uh, other than accidents and 22 years of none, it was safe, real safe plane. The Bristol operation was always a, a basic operation because we were landing on a grass airfield. The Hopu, Hopu airfield was built on peat, has a uh, firm crust on top of it. The aeroplane sometimes broke through that crust and the aeroplane would slew around, and you know, it was quite exciting at times. Always it was a a good southwest crosswind, pretty well always, and you'd come in with a large amount of drift on and you'd have to kick it off and throw the aeroplane on the ground. Once again reflected on the skill of the people involved. After flying Bristol freighters, the four-engine Argosy was quite a step up, though it didn't look a lot more graceful, as with twin tails and twin booms jutting out of a blimp-like fuselage, it could be described from the inside as a flying country hall. No one ever called it that though, as with its distinctive whistling engines and the twin booms or handlebars, it was affectionately known as the whistling wheelbarrow. And it trundled round our skies for 16 hard working years.
SAFE's first Argosy arrived from Canada in October 1973. They tried it for a while, liked it and bought another a few months later. It carried twice as much as a Bristol. The big front and rear doors made it easy to load and its flight deck, as big as a 747's, was popular with pilots. The four Rolls-Royce Dart engines burned a lot of fuel though, and on a warm day with a full load, it climbed about as fast as a goose in lead gumboots. With the contract secured to carry all NAC's cargo, the SAFE network rapidly expanded beyond the main centres to include Hamilton, New Plymouth, Palmerston North and Invercargill. As the Argosy workload increased, the Bristols were gradually phased out, though they still had the Cook Strait and Chatham's work to do. The Argosies couldn't land on the grass strip at Hapupu, but that changed when a new sealed runway was built at Karewa Point, 10 kilometres north of Waitangi. If ever a place was designed for the no-nonsense approach of a freight line and the rugged durability and safety of the Argosy, it must be this one, the Chatham Islands. Isolated some 750 kilometres east of New Zealand, the Chathams has just one cargo boat calling a month and two passenger flights and one freight flight a week. So for this isolated community of some 750 people, for the last 22 years, the Safe Air Service has been more than just essential, it's been a lifeline. Absolutely, and that's virtually what it was. It was the only contact to the mainland for the rest of the world through Safe Airways. And the only safe track, as a way that it suited everybody, the young and the old. And uh, I think people appreciated that. And also, and uh, it's something that we're going to find it hard to replace, I think. Once again, a special passenger capsule had to be built for the Chatham's run, but this time there was no need to compromise. Passengers got full airline service in a wide, comfortable cabin, and there was still plenty of room for freight in the rest of the plane. Okay. And now that freight didn't have to cross the lagoon to reach the old Harpuku airstrip, the islanders at last had a real air bridge to the mainland. The first Argosy flight to the Chathams was in June 1982 with Chief Pilot Bill Ashley in command. The actual passenger comfort took great strides ahead. Uh, the inside of the capture was virtually the same as a Boeing. There was a hostess serving tea and sandwiches. The trip was that much shorter. Uh, the Argosy being that much heavier, it was a more comfortable trip if it tended to be a wee bit rough. I think mainly it was the, the time factor and the, uh, and the noise, the less noise factor that appealed to most people. And the fact that the islanders got their mail on a regular basis and we finished up by taking all the mail ex-New Zealand. So instead of the mail coming once every six or eight weeks in the boat, it was there twice a week. So that was a big step forward for the islanders. The Argosy's mix of passengers and freight proved ideal for the island's run, and through the 80s they carried just about anything that could fit inside the spacious hold. Wool, meat, fish and school children were the main exports. And into the islands came foodstuffs, household goods, building materials and machinery of all sorts. For all those involved, the Chatham Islands wasn't just another destination on an airline schedule. Safe Air only had one passenger service to the Chathams. And the islanders only had one airline, Safe Air. For 22 years, they were mutually dependent on each other, which created a special relationship. 
far more personal, John. Far more personal. We can, uh, we're moving with the people we're dealing with, the customer in other words. So it's just more than uh, a job flying an aeroplane. You have personal input which you can give back to particularly the Chatham Islands where we are at the moment. Uh, you're part of their operation. Most pilots uh, tended to have their special friends down on the island and we still do. And of course you've done the little things for them which they couldn't get done on the island because of its isolation. We'd go and do a little bit of shopping. We've bought all sorts of odd things for people and brought them down here. And of course the old barter trade work that we did, we finished up with crayfish and fish to take back. So it worked both ways. Right. Well, we uh, actually grew up together as far as uh, air and transport was concerned. Uh, we went through a lot of hard times. We started off on the, uh, with the Bristol freighter. We started on the uh, grass strip and, and built uh, work through to the, to, the, to the new airfield that we've got today. And it's been a family arrangement, I suppose one would say. Uh, they didn't look at us as we looked at ourselves before as captive travellers. Uh, they always made planes available if we needed them. I think SAFE has given us a good ride. A great ride, as far as the Chatham is In later years, an increasing amount of SAFE's flying was at night. The rest of the country might be sleeping, but the overnight freight still had to be shifted. The ops room at Woodburn could be a lonely place waiting to switch on the runway lights for the 3am Argosy. The main trunk became a nightly Argosy odyssey, Wellington to Christchurch, Christchurch to Auckland, Auckland to Christchurch, back home to Woodburn. It was a long and lonely night shift, not very popular with air crew, but there were compensations. I think one of the nicest experiences you could have is flying on a moonlight night with heavy cumulus clouds and being above cloud and it becomes a real fairyland. You're in a, an environment all of your own. It is a, a marvellous experience particularly in the winter with the seaward kaikouras covered in snow and this sort of thing. You see views that other people perhaps only see once or twice in their lifetime. Uh, you know, over the years you see uh, the world from that altitude at various moods uh, and bad weather and good weather and everything and uh, it is a, a marvellous element and uh, I think uh, that was one of the things that I really enjoyed. There was no moon on December the 30th, 1978, but there were things that went bump in the night. Agassiz ZK SAE, piloted by Bill Startup and Bob Gard, found itself in the middle of a very strange light show off the Kaikoura coast. A film crew working for an Australian TV channel was on board, and the resulting footage caused a media sensation. The Aussies had no doubt what it was. What you have just seen, we believe, is the best documented evidence ever of an unidentified flying object. Captain Bill Startup wasn't so sure. No, I can't. Uh, I saw it, but I don't know what it is. But he was sufficiently intrigued to write a book about it all. Bill suffered a stroke and retired from flying a few years later, but he's glad to have recorded exactly what happened as he saw it. I decided to do it because everybody was putting everything about it as though they were telling me what it was, you see. And I said, well, wait on. Every time, it's a different joker. I said, I'll do it, and then oh, I don't mind if only, only one sells. I don't care about it, but um, I'll do it because the captain, they reckon, is in charge. 
an optical illusion, the planet Venus, squid boat lights, or, as some skeptics suggested, a close encounter of the absurd kind, whatever it was. Bill and the other safe pilots who made similar sightings know there was something strange going on. Too right, there was, and I, de we, I decided, home we go, I'm not going anymore. Yes, it was a bit fr frightening in the finish, but I, and I, I don't know, Bob, why well, it's the same, I don't know. You ask him, I don't know. But uh, I know I was concerned. Down we go, thank you very much. Something did go bump a few years later, on April Fool's Day, 1990. Argosy Sierra Alpha Foxtrot was approaching Wellington when the crew noticed a problem. First officer, Giles Goulden, selected the gear down and uh, going through the cockpit checks, we noted that the uh, cockpit indicator told us that the uh, port undercarriage main gear had failed to lock down. So we uh, commenced an overshoot and we carried out the abnormal management for uh, lowering the gear. Unfortunately, none of it worked. Uh, we tried a few other things that are not written down in the book to make it work, but it didn't happen. So uh, we prepared for a cautionary, uh, precautionary landing with the uh, gear unlocked. Just keep your transmissions out at this stage. We have a full emergency at Woodburn with Largacy landing. We knew we'd, the gear was definitely unlocked, so we came in as slow as possible, of course, to minimise uh, damage and things like that. And uh, as we rounded out, we uh, held it on with aileron as much as we could onto the other main wheel, knowing that that was a good one. We, and uh, as the aileron slowly lost effectiveness, and the gear collapsed, and uh, we just slid onto the side. And once it had got onto the ground, of course, it was beyond our control, and it just slid off came to a rather graceful sliding halt, and we vacated fairly promptly. Good job. There was a lot of noise associated. As soon as it went on the ground, of course, there was a lot of noise, uh, a lot of vibration, something we're not particularly used to. We're used to very smooth landings, of course, and just running out at the end. So that was a rather new experience for me. We were actually quite busy. Um, coming in, we're also quite busy, and uh, really and truly, it didn't hit us till afterwards. Uh, oh, I felt a little bit apprehensive afterwards. Yes, I mean, uh, it's probably just a little bit of shock set, and it wasn't bad. I mean, we just went and had a um, probably a medicinal gin afterwards, and uh, you know, it was probably something in reflection that uh, we sort of thought, well, it just happened, and that was it. And there was not a lot we could do about it. And that was that. Sierra Alpha Foxtrot had had its final flight. Its fuselage had been ripped open in the landing and a replacement Argosy was leased while engineers started the repair job. It was never completed. Just four months later, there was even worse news. The Air New Zealand subsidiary Safe Air is going out of business. The announcement comes just two weeks after Air New Zealand scrapped its friendship fleet. Spiro Anastasia reports. Safe Air flies two Argosy freighters around the country. After 40 years flying, Safe Air was about to be grounded. A victim of rising costs, deregulated airways and, some say, corporate politics. 112 people were to lose their jobs, though the company would continue its engineering work. I guess it's, uh, you know, it's just a, the closing effect on the profit line being pushed from both ends, I guess. It was the end of Safe's flying, the end of the Argosies, and the end of the unique Chatham service. It's a unique service we've provided to the uh, Chatham Islands and the Chatham Islanders have provided us with a unique challenge, unique customers, whether you be a cargo shipper or a passenger. It's always been a challenge, it's always been different, and it's never been, it's never been dull. In, in saying goodbye, it's been a privilege to serve you. Thank you. Haven't you? No, I haven't. Well, well, it's, haven't it's, it's oh, I haven't. Sad. Yeah, real sad. Another era gone by, isn't it? Bit of a shame. How many times a year would you use the service? 
Personal oh, average twice a year for the last five years. And how important is it for your um, your bread and milk and all those other things that are important? Yeah, yeah real important. Really. Uh, yeah, real important. What do you think of the sort of men that fly this service in this somewhat ponderous, uh, ungainly looking aircraft? <laughs> I've got a lot of admiration for them. Yeah. How important, even though you were on fit, was the safe air service? Oh, absolutely marvellous. No, it was, you know. The only thing I did, like the average cocky, he didn't like to get in the pocket touched, you know. <laughs> but she always got you there and back. Right. No, no, she was very, very good. Excellent, excellent. I've been coming out here for uh, some 18 years now. I can't say I'm very pleased to be the captain of the last flight. I would have liked to have thought that that would have carried on well beyond the end of my career. But Why do you think that this has happened? Oh, I guess it's uh, the way the world changes, perhaps uh, more emphasis on making money. Um, I guess perhaps we aren't placing as much on social issues as we perhaps were at one stage. I think it's tragic, and I expressed that to Sophie when they, uh, they told me. That aircraft is the best type of aircraft to service this island. No question about it at all. Absolutely. Not only speaking for myself, but speaking for the other safe air pilots that are now not going to come here. It's been a very special way of life. The people have been special, the operation has been special. And you felt, as we said at the start of the interview, that we were giving something back to people, and we're not going to have that anymore. We climb out across Te Whanga Lagoon, but instead of the normal turn west, Captain Perry heads east for a final circuit of the island. We pass over Kaingaroa in the northeast corner, bank steeply over Okawa Point, and cross the coast into Hanson Bay. Then it's back over Hapupu, where the safe service started 22 years earlier, and along the sparkling necklace of lakes that lie between the lagoon and the ocean. West over the coast again and across the island's narrow waste. A glimpse roads and houses below. Are the people waving goodbye, I wonder? And what might they be thinking as the Argosy makes its final fly past? A last sweep over Waitangi, then we cross the coast and head west towards the mainland. Our Air New Zealand steward, Bob Gillard, breaks out the bubbly will help the next two hours to pass more quickly. Looking round the cabin, I can't help thinking it just doesn't make sense. From sitting in an expensive, purpose-built passenger capsule, which will never be used again, and we're flying in a perfectly good aeroplane, which is about to be cut up for scrap. All this when most of the passengers on board don't even know how they're going to get back to the island. No one wants to fly here, so to speak. Or they're not geared up to fly here. It takes experience and time to get a safe and arrive at a plane like this. And as far as safe airways are concerned, we're a family of safe airways. And a special, there's been a special show. To me today, all right, uh, it's just the end of a long road. And the end of this particular road is now just a few minutes away as we cross the South Island coast and head for Christchurch Airport. 
We're a couple of hours late because of the speeches and farewell flight round Chatham Island. But no one seems to mind. In fact, on a beautiful evening like this, it seems almost a shame to come down. So for the last time ever, Argosy passengers fasten their seat belts and prepare for landing. It's quite dark now as we sweep over the lights of Christchurch and down to the runway. A couple of minutes later, we're on the ground and pulling up to the terminal gate. The passengers disperse, the last of the baggage is unloaded and the crew's work is done. It's been a long day for them and a sad one, but there's time for a final salute. <laughs> Safe Air Flight 332 has arrived from the Chatham Islands and it won't be going back. Three days later, the Argosy whistles over Woodburn for the last time. Forty years ago, most of Blenheim had come to the same place to see Safe's Bristols arrive and a new airline begin. Today, a hundred or so have gathered as it all comes to an end. Long-serving captains Ian Perry and Alan Graham are on the flight deck as the Argosy banks across the Richmond Hills and lines up on its final approach. It's the 30th of September 1990 exactly four years to the day since the company's last Bristol flight landed. The distinctive shape of both these craft, so much a part of the Marlborough sky, won't be seen again. The roar of the Bristol has gone, and as the big twin boomer rolls to a halt, the Argosy whistle also fades into aviation history. Sierra Alpha Echo has come to ground and will never fly again. Where's the red carpet? <laughs> we didn't think about it too much until about halfway across, and then I think uh, the significance of the event started to uh, take over. Wellington saw us off with fire engines and a salute and uh, from there on we realised that this was the last landing and it's a great privilege. There's a lot of uh, pilots and other company staff have gone before us and uh, it was great to be involved on the last day. I think they would have all enjoyed doing the low level downwind pass as well. It's a pilot's signature. <laughs> <laughs> it has to be a pilot's signature. Safe Air has been the bridge across Cook Strait, the highway to the Chathams and general carrier to the nation. Like the merchant ships of earlier times, Safe's Merchant Enterprise and all her merchant sister craft have delivered the goods. Hens or horses, mail or machinery, wool or wheat mix, it was all the same to Safe. A final photograph. The show's over, the crowd goes home. Just red tails in the sunset as an era ends. Safe Air grew up in the 50s, a decade of enthusiasm and prosperity in New Zealand. In the turbulent skies of a different economic era, change was inevitable. For the Chatham Islanders, as durable and resilient as the islands themselves, air service to the mainland is just another challenge to be sorted out. And they will. But for the people of the Chathams and the residents of Marlborough, it won't be safe up there anymore. <laughs>